Hello Year 7. In this lesson we're going to recap on Chaucer. We're going to have a look at the rhythm that he used in his writing and you are going to have a go at some lit hop. You may have studied the great chain of being in your history lessons. Um, if you haven't, in the medieval period people believed that there was an order, a hierarchy to society and to being in general. So at the very top you had God and then underneath God you had the king, the clergy, the nobility and then you had what we would call the middle classes but would have been the working classes at this period so tradesmen and merchants. Then you had castle workers, entertainers, the military and then at the bottom peasants. So the idea of um, the great chain of being ran through all of society. You had a specific place and a specific role. In terms of language, if you remember from our previous lessons, the people at the top, so the people in power, such as the king and the clergy and the nobility, and to some extent tradesmen and merchants, would have spoken predominantly French or Latin. So their language would have been quite distinct in terms of distinguishing those people in power. The people below would have spoken some Latin and French words, but largely particularly the peasants, they would have spoken in the vernacular. So the word that we picked up last week um, that Chaucer wrote in. So this was everyday speech and it was much more reflective of what came to be seen as English. So this was Middle English. So rather than speaking in Latin, rather than speaking in French, the lower orders, the, the people in the lower ranks of the great chain of being tended to speak Middle English and they spoke in the vernacular. So Chaucer decided to write his Canterbury Tales in the vernacular and he chose vocabulary to suit the people who would be reading it. He chose the language that would suit the people that would be reading it, but he also used a very specific rhythm and that rhythm was called iambic pentameter. And that is what we're going to learn today. Let's have a look at the idea of an I am. So you've got I am big pentameter. Now an I am, I A M B, is a metrical foot. So in terms of um, if something's metrical, it means it, it measures something. So we have metrical feet already. So if you think about measuring your height, sometimes you'll do it in centimeters and meters, but other times you'll do it in feet and inches. So metrically, um, I am five feet and three inches tall, five foot three. So we do already have metrical feet, but this, an I am, is a metrical foot that is used to measure poetry. It's used to measure language and rhythm in poetry. And the way that an I am works, you need to think of it almost like a welly or a sock. So it has a heel and a toe. And the heel and the toe, if you think about the sound that your foot makes as you walk along the ground, you put your heel down first and then your toe follows. And it sounds like this. So when you're walking, it's sometimes it will be quicker with the heel, toe, heel, toe. But you'll always be able to hear the difference between the heel going down and then the toe. Heel toe, heel toe, heel toe. And it makes a kind of da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum sound. Heel toe, heel toe. Now, some of us, we don't walk that well and we tend to trudge along, in which case it will sound trudgy. But if you walk properly, if you walk and place your heel first and then your toe, if you try it now on a hard floor in some shoes, you'll hear it. Heel toe, heel toe, heel toe, heel toe. Okay, so that is what an I am is. Think of it like a foot, a heel and a toe. Now, the stressed and the unstressed thing we'll have a look at now and what that actually means. So an I am is a metrical foot. It's think of it like a heel and a toe and it's like a da dum sound. Here are some individual words that are examples of I ams. So with the two syllables the heel and the toe, the 
dum. So if you read these aloud, you'll hear the dum sound. Behold, amuse, arise, awake, return. Behold, amuse, arise, awake, return. Depict, destroy, inject, inscribe, insist, employ, to be, inspire. So you've got behold, da dum, amuse, da dum, return. Now, it's not that far away from normal speech. And the reason I say that is because that sentence, it's not that far away from normal speech, is actually a version of iambic pentameter. If you have a look at those words there, it's not that far away from normal speech. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. We are stressing, and this is what we mean by stressed and unstressed. If you stress something, I'm doing it now, if you stress something, it means you exaggerate it, you emphasise it. I am stressing the word stress in my sentence. So to stress means that you emphasise that particular part of the word or that particular syllable. If something is unstressed, it means that it drops down a level. You don't exaggerate it. So if you look at the word behold, 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 the B bit, you almost don't even pronounce the B, behold. You say behold, and the emphasis, the stress is on hold. So if you have a look at the word return, it's almost like you can't even say it without stressing the second bit, but the first bit, the R bit, is unstressed. It almost hides in your mouth. Return. The turn is the stress bit. Return. Um, same with destroy. Destroy. Da dum. The second part of that word, the stroy bit, is the stressed bit. It's the exaggerated bit. It's the emphasized bit. Inject. Inscribe. Employ. Do you see? Stressed? Don't be. If you think about this unstressed and stressed idea, what people do when they're looking at poetry, and particularly when they're exploring the rhythm of poetry, is they use little marks like this above the line to help them see where things, where syllables are stressed and when they're unstressed. So it's quite straightforward, really. If you think about the symbol for an unstressed syllable, it looks a bit like a smile because you're unstressed. So a smile indicates an unstressed syllable. That syllable is calm, it's quiet, it's quite happy. If you want to emphasise a stressed syllable, that's when you draw a straight line upwards. Now, I've said it looks a bit like a frown, because if you were to do this um, on a winky face type thing, or on an emoticon, if you typed it in, the forward slash indicates a wonky mouth, doesn't it? It's kind of like the frown face. So unstressed syllables, happy, smiling, calm, quiet. Stressed syllables, it's sharp, it's an angle, it's frowning, it's emphasised, it's exaggerated. So if we have a look back now at our sentence from the previous slide, what I've done is I've drawn on the unstressed and stressed symbols. So you can see where it is that the syllable needs to be stressed. So we go it's happy, unstressed, it's not that far away from normal speech. So the emphasis is on not far away normal speech. And the unstressed syllables are it's that a uh, from mo. It's not that far away from normal speech. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. Here's an example from Chaucer himself. So at the beginning of the prologue, um, he uses iambic pentameter and you can see the stressed and unstressed syllables. So we go smile, frown, smile, frown. So unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, duh, dum, duh, dum. When that April with his chures souté. When that April with his chures souté. The drought of March have pierced the to the root. So my pronunciation is not very good. Mrs. Collins is way better at it than me. But the way that he uses rhythm 
is iambic pentameter. He has an unstressed and a stressed syllable. And that's what gives it the rhythm of everyday speech. It's not that far away from normal speech. So we still need to get to the root of the meaning of the entire concept then. So we know what an I am is now. It is um, a metrical foot. It has two parts to it, the D, dum. It is one unstressed and one stressed syllable. So if one I am is a da dum, how many I ams must one line of iambic pentameter need? So if you think about that prefix penta, how many iams are needed in one line of iambic pentameter? And there's a clue in the picture for any of you that are into your adventure stories. What does penta mean? How many iams must there be in one line of iambic pentameter? Those of you shouting five at the screen are correct. One line of iambic pentameter has five iams because it is a pentameter. It's a measure of five pentagon um, of iams. Iambic pentameter, five iams in a row. So you've got five lots of unstressed, stressed. Da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum, da dum. It's not that far away from normal speech. Therefore, you've got, if you count them, 10 syllables. Now, syllables, you will know this, but just to remind you, they are little portions of words that make up a beat um, in a particular word or phrase. So if you think of your name, my name is Joanna Bates. So it is Joanna Bates, which is one, two, three, four syllables. Um, my dog's name is Albus Dumbledog. So his is one, two, Albus, Dumble Dog plus three. So five syllables, Albus, Dumble Dog. I don't call him that all the time, but it was a long name. So syllables are one beat. Therefore, if you have a look, if an I am is a da dum, two beats, then one line of iambic pentameter, we know that there's five I ams. We know that in an I am there are two syllables. Therefore, each line needs 10 syllables. It's not that far away from normal speech. 10 syllables. Right, here we go. Your task is to write a song, a poem or a rap using iambic pentameter. Now, your song, poem or rap needs to be on the topic of Chaucer. And you could include things such as an explanation of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, what they were, an explanation of the word vernacular, an explanation of how people would have felt to read books in their own language, uh, an explanation of iambic pentameter, that would be interesting, information about Chaucer and information about pilgrimages. So I would like you to have a go at writing a song, a poem or a rap. To help you with this, in your classroom, there is a grid and the grid breaks each line down into 10 boxes. So there are some examples in there and you will see where words have been broken down into their syllables. So I've put some examples in there um, to help you and hopefully that grid will help you work out the rhythm of your song, poem or rap. It does not have to rhyme. It doesn't have to rhyme. If you want to rhyme it, then by all means have a go. But first, let's focus on the rhythm and then we'll look next lesson at rhyme. So good luck. Have fun with it. It's not supposed to be stressful. Pardon the pun. Um, enjoy and we look forward to reading your work.